Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And this program exists by the generosity of EWTN, of course, and uh, it was Mother Angelica's inspiration. Way back when, Mother thought, after she had received so many letters from uh, viewers who particularly were concerned about children and siblings who had left the church, that uh, after she had heard my conversion and others, she had thought, boy, if, if our audience could hear the stories of men and women who've come back to the church, it would give them hope that maybe their children and siblings too would come back to the church. And I think that's proved to be the case after 20 years of this program. And uh, as with all the programs at EWTN, it's an encouragement uh, for uh, people to hear that during rough times, there's the church. During rough times, there's the church and her sacraments and her community and all that's here in the church. And so um, that might be a bit of the theme that's going to run through part of our program tonight. Our guest tonight is a returning guest, Dawn Eden Goldstein, convert from Judaism, et cetera. Well, we'll talk about that. But Dawn, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much. Now, probably need to explain to our audience that they remember maybe when you were on before, but uh, maybe the name was it slightly different. <laughs> That's right. Well, I always loved that my parents gave me the middle name Eden. So for <laughs> many years, I used that as my professional name. But once I received my doctorate in sacred theology from the University of St. Mary of the Lake, also known as Mundelein, yep. uh, because of Mundelein Seminary there, I felt that because it was thanks to my grandparents' emphasis on the value of education, as well as my parents' yep. emphasis, that I was able to get a doctorate, I should use the family name. So I'm now Dawn Eden Goldstein, professionally right. as well as personally. All right. And assistant professor of dogmatic theology at Holy Angels College Holy and Apostles. Seminary. Holy Apostles, excuse me. Why I keep saying that? Holy Apostles. Uh, I think there's a Holy Angel Monastery somewhere, right? There is. <laughs> and there is also a Holy Angels Seminary. That's right. Oh, that's right. So... Uh, but also I want to mention that dawneden.blogspot.com is uh, the site where they can go find out more. That's right. About what you're doing. All right. Well, what I normally do with returning guests is I invite you to give us a, a shortened summary of your journey. For those that didn't see the original program, though, you were on in 2012. So that's available on uh, EWTN website as well as the Coming Home Network website and YouTube. So. I invite you to remind us of how the Lord brought you into the church. Sure, sure. I'll be I'll be delighted to. Uh, th there are two stories that 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 I tell. You know, one is simply about how the Lord brought me into the church, and the other has to do with s some of the suffering I went through in, yeah. in in childhood. And I'll combine those for uh, for you because uh, because I know that you know in our in our pro program uh, today we're going to speak uh, about. Uh, about yeah. suffering uh, as well. Uh, so I was born into a Jewish household, Reform Jewish, so the most, or the more li liberal uh, branch of the faith. And uh, when I was, uh, when I was five, my parents split up. I was raised, my sister and I, uh, older sister, uh, Jennifer, uh, and I were raised by uh, our mother. And it was just uh, at that uh, at that time, also uh, when I was five, uh, that I suffered sexual abuse for the first time. Uh, I was molested by the janitor at the mm -hmm. temple uh, that my family uh, attended, uh, and uh, I was afraid to tell my mother about it. The janitor said, "Keep it a secret," and uh, like many. Uh, child victims and adult uh, victims of abuse, I blamed myself. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and then when I finally had the courage to tell my mother, she went to the rabbi and uh, the rabbi called in the janitor and it was his word against mine and the rabbi believed him. Uh, and then uh, a few years later, uh, I suffered uh, abuse um, in different ways at, 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 at home, particularly from uh, one of my mother's boyfriends. Um, more than that, it was the 1970s. Now, I'm not 
using that as any kind of excuse uh, because uh, I know some some people have used the blame Woodstock uh, uh, excuse for uh, for abuse, and I'm not saying that, uh, but certainly. I was not the only child in the 1970s who lived in a household where adults were experimenting with all sorts of things, including household nudity. I only learned yeah. as an adult when I started to research causes of post-traumatic stress after I was diagnosed with PTSD that it's not only contact abuse that can cause post-traumatic stress, it's also non-contact abuse because children aren't prepared to see adults um, mm. practicing household nudity or making sex talk uh, around children, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so these are various uh, wounds uh, that I suffered, but I still uh, was serious about my Jewish uh, faith um, until um, my bat mitzvah. Uh, at the time when I was when I was uh, rece receiving uh, guidance, being prepared for, as one properly says, becoming a bat mitzvah, meaning uh, I believe it means daughter of the commandment. That's the rite of passage that, that Jewish youths uh, go through to, to become an adult in the Jewish faith. For a, a woman, it's bat mitzvah. For a man, bar mitzvah. Uh, I had one of the most difficult Torah portions uh, of the liturgical year, my Torah portion that I was to read uh, in Hebrew and comment upon, and here I was at the age of um, 12 going on 13, uh, it was uh, the section from, uh, De from Deuteronomy, I think it begins in chapter 22, it's called in Hebrew, Ki say, and it's all these laws uh, on purity. And so I had things like, cursed is he who hangs from a tree. Uh, and uh, I didn't know what this meant. I thought it was rather cruel to curse someone who's already hanging from a tree. You know, <laughs> sounds like it's adding insult uh, for, to injury. And I remember asking the rabbi about these things, and the rabbi basically said, not in so many words, don't you worry your pretty head about that stuff. Uh, what he said was that there were uh, scholars who spent years studying these things, and I really didn't have to worry about this, just get through my bat mitzvah. And what I really took that as was a message that even though I was supposed to be becoming an adult in the Jewish faith, I really wasn't an adult. I really wasn't mm. respected. And so uh, that put me off from mm. Judaism. And I was also entering my teens, which is when you know, childhood trauma can begin to manifest itself. In my case, I began to suffer from cyclical suicidal uh, depression, which plagued me through my teens and 20s. I had uh, the temptation to uh, self-harm by cutting. And so it was right at that time that I started to think, well, where was God? Uh, can God really love me uh, if I'm um, feeling this pain? And I still didn't connect the pain at that time to childhood uh, abuse. Um, I just thought, you know, I must be a bad person to be suffering this pain and God must not love me. And it seems like there's nothing I can do to make things better. Uh, then as a, as a, a teen uh, in college, uh, I, I entered college a, a year, uh, or I graduated high school a year early, entered college, New York University at 17. I was living on Washington Square Park in New York City. Uh, although I was never into drugs or drinking, I definitely uh, was seeking to self-medicate uh, uh, through through relationships, through just wanting to be appreciated, I should say, relationships and and affairs with yeah. with with men, uh, really wanting love and thinking that the only way I could get love would be if I if I was sexually attractive to men and available uh, to to, the, to them. 
I think I also had wounds from my parents' divorce and my father being distant at that, at that time. Uh, I became a rock and roll journalist, eventually a rock and roll historian. <laughs> I still love that era. Um, I, I don't know, Marcus, if you ever uh, were into, into, into you know, you're a bit young, young for this, but if you were ever into the music of the 60s, that's what oh, I was. I, I, I was even in, into the music of the 50s, so I'm a, I've been around a bit. Uh, <laughs> played in a band called The Strangers in the 60s. So Really? There were a to, lot of bands so. called The Strangers. That was one of the more popular names. There was a band in Greenwich Village that used to play the Café Wa called The Strangers. That wasn't us. <laughs> Um, so I became a rock historian and I interviewed artists like Brian Wilson from the mm -hmm. Beach Boys, mm -hmm. Harry Nilsson, Del Shannon, Gene Pitney, Leslie Gore. Uh, I, I also uh, interviewed some artists that were newer from beyond my era, like <laughs> Elton John. <laughs> I, I was very much a, 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 a music snob at that time, thinking that I would just specialize in the music from just before I was born, so from the mid-60s. I remember that era. The, the guitar that I have at home was designed and played by Denny Zager, who wrote the, uh, the, the most famous one-hit wonder he wrote in the year. Zager and Evans in yes, the year 25, 25. 25. Yes, yes. That's back in the 68, 69, I think that was. so. Right about, right about then. That's, that's right. I think it may not have actually peaked on the charts till 1970. It was just on the cusp. Wow, yep. very very good. Yep. Uh, so, so I loved loved that uh, that music, uh, that brought me uh, brought me jo joy. Um, and uh, you know, I can honestly say joy in the sense that that anything that um, God God can use certain worldly things that are not in themselves sinful to give us uh, a taste of the goodness that that we will experience in its in its yep. fullness in heaven and there were certain songs there was a band that i was into that was actually called the millennium <laughs> uh, that had these songs that you know even though they were new new age uh, these were songs that were looking to an ideal time an ideal Barry McGuire. Play Yes, <laughs> I actually I actually knew P. F. Sloan and interviewed him. P. F. Sloan, who wrote *Eve of Destruction*, yep, yep. Barry Maguire's uh, biggest hit. Uh, so, uh, so I uh, that was where I was getting you know the closest thing I had to joy at that time, and it was through my love of rock and roll that God you know just found that or made that you know crack in the door to begin to reach me with the grace of conversion. I just want to you mentioned that our guest is Don Eden Goldstein. Well, one thing you're pointing out that, that what is good is of God. Yes. What is good is of God. Even, you know, God can use a great variety of, you know, uh, uh, the, the song that came out at that time, what the world needs now is love. Well, yes. Now we, we have we need the church to help us make sure we understand what love is all exactly. about. But the church, the world does need love, and what that song said was true. But it, we needs to be in the context of the church. That's uh, that's right. And so when I was uh, twenty seven, back in December uh, uh, nineteen ninety five. I was doing a telephone interview with a rock musician from a newer band called The Sugar Plastic. Uh, his name was Ben Eschbach. And I thought I would ask him a really bright question uh, because I was looking for affirmation. And so I thought I'd show him how smart I was by asking him <laughs> what he was reading lately. Now, you may recall, I didn't know this at the time, but, uh, but C.S. Lewis spoke uh, about how dangerous books can be because they can lead you out of you know your atheism or agnosticism in my case i was a card carrying agnostic by that time in the 90s and so ben eschbach told me that he was currently reading a book by an author i had never heard of i'm sure you've heard of him gk chesterton <laughs> and the book was called the man who was thursday and I thought, well, I'll go out and pick up this book so that when Mr. Eschbach comes to town, I can impress him by telling him I've read it. I had no idea that Chesterton was this great 
Anglican convert to Catholicism. And so I just started reading this novel, and what I got from it was this powerful theodicy, this, this uh, kind of discourse. It was, it was an exciting spy novel on one level, but on another level, it was a powerful discourse on evil, on where is God when we are suffering. And it ends with this suggestion. It's very subtle. It doesn't hit it didn't hit me over the, the head with a hammer, you know, but it ended with this suggestion that God himself in Jesus Christ had interior knowledge of suffering. And I had never heard that before. As a Jew hearing Christians talk, I just thought of Christianity as being very triumphalist, very about, you know, the victory. And I hadn't thought of Christianity as being something that might give meaning to suffering. Well, unfortunately, there are an awful lot of Christians that don't appreciate that aspect of the faith either. I mean, that's, like you said, when you get outside the boundaries and you start reinterpreting what the faith means outside the boundaries of the church, you can, you can have a Christianity without suffering. And there, it's out there. And, uh, and I, that's a big point about the Catholic faith as well as the saints that we draw attentions to, that suffering is a very important part of our growing closer to Christ. It's so true. And as a student of theology, when I began to study the Second Vatican Council, I learned that the Bishop's Extraordinary Synod of 1985 said that one of the most important messages of the Council that needed to be taught was the theology of the cross. Yeah, and then one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament for many of our non-Catholic Christians is Colossians 1.24. You know how Paul says, I celebrate, I, I rejoice in my suffering and complete what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the church. And the question, wait a second, you know, how do you understand that? Well, John Paul, after that, wrote an whole entire cyclical yes, on you know, that Lord. passage, you know. Of yes, suffering. that's right. And I actually... I actually wrote an entire dissertation <laughs> on that. I did my dissertation on on recent uh, Catholic magisterial teaching on redemptive suffering from Pius XII to oh. the present day. And what I found in studying what the church teaches about that is that is that our Lord Jesus Christ suffered in time uh, and he uh, and all the power of redemption comes from his redemptive act on the cross and since we are members of his body, we continue his redemptive suffering in our lives. So the way I like to say it in my book, My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints, is that Jesus suffered for us, but he's not yet suffered in us. Uh, he wants us to say yes to, to uniting our suffering with, with his so that our suffering through, always through his power might become redemptive as well. That was a saving truth for me. You know, the thing that, um, that I've learned, it's taken a long time, it's maybe because of my mental denseness, uh, obtuseness, but, but the, the beauty is when we look at the lives of the saints and even some of the writers, um, is that suffering is essential for our moving forward in holiness. And uh, Paul talks about that, Romans 8. But because God loves us, he also, as he says in 1 Corinthians, gives us what we can handle and the grace necessary. Some people are given more suffering than others. And rather than get, the danger is we get caught up in, why me, why me? Rather than saying, okay, Lord, why me? Why me? In other words, you see something in me that needs to get cut out really badly, or I need to surrender more, or it's he, but he's, the goal always is drawing us closer or to there's, him. Or there's someone whom I would like God to save, and God is permitting this suffering so that through my prayers, he might save this person. There's something beautiful that Pope Francis said recently uh, in, I believe, a Wednesday audience. Uh, he said that the 
question that God eventually brings us to is not why I am suffering, but for whom mm. am I suffering? And maybe to me, the most powerful, most deep statement in Scripture about the life of accepting suffering is John the Baptist's simple statement, I must decrease, he must increase. For that to happen takes some stuff to get cut out of me and letting go, right? I mean, that's... It's, it's so true. Uh, so the rest of my journey to Catholicism uh, went from um, reading Chesterton for about four years. I was a hard nut to crack. I didn't come in right away. <laughs> then becoming a non-denominational non church. I got baptized. Uh, uh, actually, I became, did I say I became a church? I became a non-denominational <laughs> Christian. Actually, I was baptized in an Adventist church, uh, but I asked if I could not make the Adventist promises and just be non-denominational, and the pastor kindly agreed. I was determined to be ABC, anything but Catholic. My mother had actually entered the church back in 1986. Uh, that was 14 years before I was baptized in 2000, but by the time I was baptized, long before, my mother had fallen away. And so, uh, from her, I had the impression that you don't have to be Catholic to be Christian, which, strictly speaking, is true. What I didn't know is that, is that the Catholic Church truly is the church that Jesus founded, and only here are the sacraments that come to us from his beating heart. So, eventually, after church shopping, I became drawn to the church really through its teaching on life mm. and the dignity of every human life. And interestingly enough, God even used the scandals to help to bring me into the church. Mm. In 2002, a couple of years after my baptism, I was in this G.K. Chesterton reading group in New York. I was one of the only non-Catholics in that reading group. And I remember mentioning the scandals in the reading group, and my impression was that uh, Catholics just thought that the scandals were um, concocted by the media, which hates the church. I thought that the Catholics thought that the scandals were just a lot of wind. So I mentioned this in the group. I said to, to the Catholics there, I said, I know you don't think that the priests are really abusing, and they said, what are you talking about? Of course we believe you know, these reports. And I, I said, really? Because when I see Catholic spokespeople, they just say it's that the media hates the church. And they said, no, this is our church. We want it purified. We want these things to come to light so that there can be purification and reform. And that made me begin to take the Catholic Church's claims seriously. And then as I learned what the Catholic Church uh, teaches about the dignity of human life from conception until natural mm -hmm. death, and I began to, to study what abortion really is, what in vitro fertilization really is, and why the Catholic Church stands firmly against these things, because the Catholic Church believes that Every child has the right to be, be born from the union of its parents, and every child has the right to be born. Um, that drew me into the church um, through a story that I tell in the 2012 episode of Journey Home that's available on YouTube, and uh, which, you know, just for length's sake, I won't go into now. When I was working as a headline writer and copy editor for the New York Post, I found myself given a story to copy edit that was pro-IVF, and I wrongly altered it to make it pro-life. I say wrongly because I didn't ask permission. I should have asked permission, and then if I were fired for refusing to copy edit this, this um, pro-IVF story, uh, I would have done the right thing. Instead, I tried to change it into a pro-life story without telling my bosses, and I got fired not only for that, but also more the, the bigger reason why I was fired was that I had a pro-life blog, which was discovered at that time. I'm trying to imagine that writer 
going out for a, a drink after work and then someone said, hey, I didn't know you were pro-life. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, exactly. The reporter was furious, but now I can thank her. I can sit here and I can thank Susan Edelstein of the New York Post for getting me fired and call Allen, who was, who, who was the editor-in-chief then for throwing me out of his office and saying, you are a liability. You know, now I can say, praise the Lord. You know, Genesis 50, 20, for you meant it for evil, but God meant it for, for good. That's, that's how I feel about them now. And so that, that, you know, drove me into the Catholic Church, being fired by the post, because I kind of thought, wait a minute, I've just been martyred for life. And it's kind of stupid to be martyred for defending the dignity of the unborn and not be in the church that's been making martyrs for the dignity of human life for 2,000 years. So praise God, I entered Easter Vigil 2006. And uh, then I became an author. I wrote my first book uh, on chastity for mm -hmm grown-ups who missed the memo on abstinence, <laughs> the thrill of the chaste, finding fulfillment while keeping your clothes on. Uh, I, I wrote that while I was in RCIA, and I later rewrote it in a Catholic edition uh, for Ave Maria Press. Uh, and then I went on to study towards my doctorate in sacred theology, and I wrote two books on healing from trauma. Mm -hmm. The one I mentioned earlier, My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints, and a more recent book of Ignatian Spirituality for Healing of Memories mm -hmm. called Remembering God's Mercy. You know, when we get back, that's one of the first things I want to talk to you about, and that is, you know, we don't want to in any way make light of, of the hurt that that people feel. But when I get back, I want to talk about how, in fact, there's an edge to when a scandal happens publicly, or at least made public, that it has a way of helping people heal who've had this stuff down yes. in their lives. It gives them a chance to deal. Maybe we can talk about that when we come right back. And for those of you that are watching, uh, just a reminder, if, if any of the things that we talk about in this program, including someone's becoming open to the church, uh, touches your life and you'd love to uh, discuss more and how you'd like help on that journey, please call the Coming Home Network or contact us at, at the chnetwork.org website, chnetwork.org. You'll see information on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the screen uh, on how we can help you on your journey home to the church. See you Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Dawn Eden Goldstein. And uh, so we've, other than my interruptions, my rude interruptions, I helped you get through your story. Um, but I wanted to come back to this issue of, I mean, here we are uh, in a time when you know, people are saying, you know, how did the church get so bad? And in some ways I joke, say, well, it's not, it's that we just found out more. Right, right, exactly. I, I mean, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I've always joked that, you know, if you think the church is bad, it got worse when I joined it. <laughs> you know, we, we, we're, we're all sinners, yes. so we're not standing here pointing fingers at anyone, That's but right. we're trying to help people understand how to deal with it. And it's in the news, as you were talking about earlier in your interview with people that sometimes go on the news that don't represent the church very well. But just before we took to the break, I wanted to talk about how, in fact, a scandal can offer channels of healing for people because it helps them deal with stuff in their life that they've kept down. That's right. So I have knowledge of this just from my own experience of interacting with readers with, the, with writing my books on healing from trauma, my piece I give you, Remembering God's Mercy. I found that with my piece I give you, which is a not graphic, but frank book on recovering from childhood sexual abuse, about two-thirds of readers would get through the 
introduction, which is where I, again, not graphically, but frankly, speak about my own uh, abuse. And this, these two-thirds of readers would then just put down the book for about three months, and then they'd pick it up uh, again. Some of them would, at least. And those who made it all the way through would then thank me. They'd say, oh, it's so helpful. But what I realized was that they had not yet really begun to address their own abuse. They had not yet really begun to admit they were abused. The, the first step to healing is to say, what happened to me was abuse. It was wrong. It was not my fault. I need help. Um, and that's the hardest step. You know, this is similar to the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous, other 12-step yeah. programs, which were uh, which certainly AA was developed by someone who, who had had an encounter with Christ and who also received some guidance from a wonderful Jesuit yep. priest, Father Edward Dowling. That's the first step to admit that one needs help. Um, so I ended up, when I wrote Remembering God's Mercy, leaving out any discussion of what I suffered to make it just gentle so that that's the, the soft introduc introductory book so that if people can get through that, which thankfully they do, then they, they're ready for the previous book I wrote, my piece I, I give you. So in answer to your question, I think that when people read stories about uh, abuse, not only clergy abuse, but other stories of abuse that have come to, to light in recent weeks and months, they can begin to process what was done to them as abuse and then begin to get help, enter into healing. And by help, I mean help for every aspect of the human person because we're not just mind, we're not just body, we're not just spirit, we're all three. So if a person has suffered any kind of trauma, to get the best, the fullest healing, they need not just psychological help, not just medical help if they have some physical symptoms because there are certain uh, diseases like fibromyalgia uh, that are linked to childhood uh, trauma, but they also need spiritual help, help from meeting Christ through a close relationship with him in the sacraments, in the word of God, uh, and, and also, um, you know, I've certainly found myself that my own healing has really been aided by regular spiritual direction as well. As a professor, of, assistant professor of dogmatic theology, you know, I find it interesting thinking about the boundaries that dogmatic theology talks about, the, of the truth, so we yes. understand. Yes. And it's very important because throughout the centuries, people have dealt with sins of the flesh in different ways. There are some that said, that you know, more of a, a, a Gnostic perspective, that what I do with my body, on the one hand, they could say it's the body is completely bad. Um, anything I do with my body ultimately is bad. All that counts is my spirit, my soul. So they can have a, a, a mentality that almost shuts down the body or any relationships because it's bad. Mm -hmm. It's all about what's going on in my mind. The other extreme is it doesn't matter what I do with my body. It's only what I do with my mind that makes sense. So whatever I do with my mind doesn't matter. So you have these complete Gnostic extremes. Mm -hmm. But dogmatic theology teaches that, no, we're body and soul. That's right. We're one person. The importance of understanding that to dealing with the aberrations in our culture. It is. It's very important. And I think our culture really lives this Gnosticism. Uh, we see this in the post-sexual sexual revolution idea uh, that um, people should be free to do whatever they wish sexually with, with their bodies and not have any kind of dogma telling them that it might harm them. And certainly I was victimized by that mentality. I'm not um, refusing to take responsibility for sins that I committed when I, when I was an adult and conscious of my action, but I was influenced by that mentality, thinking that uh, if I'm engaging in unchastity and I'm feeling emotional, spiritual pain from it, thinking, well, you know, the culture is telling me that in that case I'm doing it wrong, because if I'm doing this 
this um, sexual activity right, I shouldn't be feeling pain. Well, as I say in The Thrill of the Chaste, in fact, um, in fact, that is what does normally happen if one is engaging in sexual activity or, um, outside of marriage or any kind of unchastity. And unchastity, you know, married people have to live chastely mm -hmm. as well, according to, to the, the duties of married life. Um, and so what normally happens in the order of, one, of things is that one does feel the pain that comes from, from sinning. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a sick culture that teaches people that they have to numb themselves from the pain that comes from, from sin. So as I studied what the Catholic Church teaches about, about chastity I, and about the unity of mind, body, spirit, I found this actually makes sense with my personal experience. A teacher of dogmatic theology teaches that the spiritual battle the battle that every single one of us goes through traditionally has been described with three things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We live in a culture that doesn't believe in that third aspect. And if you leave that third battle out so that our only battle is with the world and with the flesh, you set yourself up, you set a culture up for a losing battle and individuals, and I was thinking especially in your case, in the sense of when you went through the cyclical suicide, um, if you don't realize there's a spiritual battle going on with that third part of the enemy trying to get you, and you know, then if you don't realize that, then it's either just me, it's just the way that I am, or I've only I picked it up through my environment, the world, or it's a part of me, I can't help it, the flesh, to realize there's a battle. Or the on. idea that God hates me because, because uh, the, the, the devil, you know, even the devil will cite scripture for his purpose. Yeah. And so if people are even thinking about God, he may try to convince them uh, that they're hopeless cases, that yeah. there's nothing they can do yeah. to attain God's mercy. Oh, yes, um, I don't know who said it. I'm sure you do, that, that one of the devil's greatest tricks is yeah. to try to convince people that he, the devil, doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. That's certainly what we're seeing in our culture. And, you know, as Catholics, we do have to be balanced. Um, as uh, as St. Uh, Ignatius of Loyola says, our acts can be inspired by either the good spirit, which is to say the Holy Spirit, the bad spirit, which is the, the enemy, yeah. or ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we, we can't, you know, always say the devil made me do it. But I now know as I look back on, uh, on you know, before I knew, uh, I knew the love of, uh, and mercy of Jesus Christ, that there was a spiritual battle going on and that was aggravating the pain from my cyclical suicidal uh, depression. Yeah, we can joke use cartoons to joke about little little guys in red suits on our shoulders mm -hmm. and angels on our shoulders and say, oh yeah, I remember that as a kid, that's just a big joke, it's all myth, or old, good old Flip Wilson saying, oh, the devil made me do it, remember? Those little... Yes, I do. But there's truth there, though. Yes. There's truth there, and that's the way the devil laughs, is the, that if we can belittle the devil, then he can continue to whisper in our mind, especially people that are discouraged or they've had things happen to them, and then in the end, the devil can get them to be convinced that they're not worth it, that God doesn't love them, that there's not salvation, that there's not hope. Yes, that does, that can happen. And, you know, thank, thank God, as I believe uh, St. Paul says, God gives more grace. Yeah. So God always has far more grace, you know, available than anything the devil can throw at us. And I now know, uh, particularly from my research on on the theology of suffering, that yeah. God never positively wills that anything evil should befall us. He only permits evil uh, because in his divine providence, he can bring good out of it. I, uh, from time to time, have the blessing of getting together with family. I have cousins who are women about my age, and 
when I see them, you know, they're, uh, they're still, uh, they still con consider themselves uh, Jewish. To the best of my knowledge, they didn't suffer trauma such as I suffered in childhood. And they're reasonably happy. So that really helps me because I see a comparison and I, and I see that I could have been reasonably happy had I not suffered abuse and I would have remained Jew, a practicing Reformed Jew. I'm, I'll always be <laughs> Jewish in my identity. Uh, and so uh, what, what I see is that I know that even on my worst day as a Catholic, even when I have a flashback and I'm suffering PTSD, I still feel a joy within that I didn't know on my best days before I knew the love of, of Christ in his church. And so I can thank God now for his divine providence because if I hadn't suffered those traumas, yeah. I don't know that the Lord would have made me realize how much I need him, how desperately I need him. Uh, so, you know, in that way, as we were saying before with Colossians 1, 24, I can rejoice in, mm -hmm. in my sufferings. Don Eden Goldstein is our guest today. Um, talk about, if you would, seems to me there are three things that have helped you through this and maybe more, but three basic things that helped you and talk about how they can help others in the midst of it. You talk about truth, you talk about the sacraments, and you talk about prayer. Seems like those three things are really key to help a person through a difficult time. Very much. So first, the truth is being honest with ourselves about what we have suffered or what we are suffering. Truth also means recognizing the demands of justice. You know, uh, St. Maria Goretti is one of the great saints for victims of mm. abuse, mm. and she's rightly held up as a saint of forgiveness. But there are a couple of things important to notice. Number one, when St. Maria Goretti forgave her mm. attacker, he wasn't holding the knife up to her at the time that she forgave him. She wasn't forgiving him while he was actively yeah. abusing. It was at a time when he could no longer harm her that she forgave him. So forgiveness is not excusing the evil, it's not enabling the evil. And, uh, it, and as the Catechism tells us, not in so many words, but if one looks up forgiveness in the Catechism, one sees that forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. Ideally, it leads to that, but the Catechism says that forgiveness is interior. Moreover, it's not our work, thank God. Yeah. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And it's an act of the will. I mean, yes. we choose, you don't like feel. Yes, exactly. Forgiven. I think about those, remember the Amish families that lost all those, those girls that were shot, and yet they forgave the man. Well, it's an act of the will. It's a choice of that. Or John Paul, when he forgave the man who had shot. Exactly. Uh, that's why our Lord tells us that it's 70 times 7 yeah. that, we, uh, that we forgive. It may be 70 times 7 forgiving the same person the same thing in the same day as often as it comes to us. We will to forgive. Um, and St. Maria Goretti also, uh, even as she forgave her attacker, she described him to the police mm -hmm. so that he could face the demands of justice. So that's important. Justice and mercy are not opposed. They're two sides of the same uh, of the same coin. And I was thinking another aspect about truth is that, and this is a different aspect than what you're talking about, but truth, in other words, we, what we, in the midst of a scandal, we don't see the church fudging truth. That's right. To fit what a few leaders might think the direction it should go. No, this is what's true. That's why we're Catholic, because we see this continuity and the authority behind what is true about life and, and the church holds to that. Amen, yes, and that was very important for me in entering the church, seeing the church's consistent witness to the dignity of every human person and the dignity of every human life, consistent over 2,000 years. Uh, so the second thing that you mentioned, sacraments. the sacraments. So 
I didn't really understand the power of the sacraments until I became a Catholic. Mm -hmm. I envy those people who say, as they were Protestants, I think Scott Hahn is one of these people, <laughs> that as soon as they saw the Eucharist being celebrated in a Catholic church, they knew that was <laughs> Jesus. I didn't automatically uh, know. And even today, every so often, the Lord will give me a grace where I will really feel in a sensible way that's Jesus. Um, but, you know, more often than not, I say, you know, at you know, the elevation of the Eucharist, I believe, Lord, help my, my unbelief. unbelief. Yes. That's a good prayer. I think we should all, you know, pray that prayer as needed, on an as-needed yeah. basis. But once, where I really began to believe in Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist was when I began to see the effect it had on my life. I remember when I was first getting treatment for PTSD, which was as a Catholic. It wasn't until, uh, until I was 40 that I was diagnosed with PTSD. It's often misdiagnosed. In fact, even what I had that was diagnosed as cyclical suicidal depression was really PTSD. Mm. With my receiving Jesus, I was healed of the suicidal aspect, praise God, mm. because I, I knew that God loved me. He had a purpose for me. I couldn't even think of harming myself anymore, but I still would get flashbacks, teariness, anxiety. Uh, so I remember when I was beginning to deal with this in therapy, also in spiritual direction, my spiritual director said to me gently, why don't you make a novena of daily masses? And I now realize that was his <laughs> tricky way of trying to trick me into getting hooked on daily mass. And I have to say my healing really got jump-started with daily mass. And of course, if one is receiving uh, the Eucharist, often one wants to remain in a state of grace so that one can receive the full effects. So I began to follow St. Francis de Sales' advice about uh, confessing, ma making confession every two weeks, more often if I need <laughs> it, but you know, as a general rule of thumb, every two weeks. And that's when I really began to see the effects of grace in my life. And finally, prayer. Well, before we go there, I always want to add one thing to that because you mentioned that, that wonderful prayer, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I, I sometimes think that, yeah, we've had some guests on the program, I think of Dr. Kenneth Howell particularly, who, when I mean, that was it, once he saw the host, he knew and, and God had almost infused a love and, and, a and gift. I mean, praise God. It doesn't happen for all of us. And I think especially those of us that have a long history uh, as a Protestant pastor, long history as a pastor that only believed in the Eucharist as a symbol at best, that we sometimes carry that as a suffering to offer it up for the many who, because of the barriers in their life, would never be open to the sacraments. And so, Lord, take this for them that maybe by grace they might be open to the beauty of the sacraments because we put so many barriers to people out there. And it's not helping now because of a scandal in the church that might even be a bigger barrier to them being open to the, the sacramental graces. So that's our way of saying, Lord, okay, I pray for, you know, please give me a deeper understanding of it, but really please help them. You know, it's so interesting to hear you say that, Marcus, because I do have a similar prayer when I'm confronted, you know, at the elevation with my desire. I wish that I could be like the saints who actually saw the child <laughs> Jesus being held up, you know. When I'm confronted with that desire and, and I get, you know, frustrated, why don't I actually see Jesus? Um, then rather than remain in that frustration, I think, well, I am going to offer up this vision of, of the Eucharist for the holy souls who long, in purgatory who long to see his face. I will offer it up for all the people in countries where they're persecuted or in places where they don't have regular access to a, a priest and to the Eucharist. And I will ask God to take whatever graces I'm receiving just from looking at the Eucharist and to give it to those people. Yeah. You know, the third point on prayer, I mean, you've already been talking about it. Yes, and, <laughs> and scripture. 
very, yeah. uh, very important reading sacred scripture daily. Lately, I've been spending way too much time on a computer screen. I teach <laughs> online now, and I'm also uh, completing my, uh, my next book, which is my conversion memoir. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I find that I need to do, as Pope Francis says, carry the Gospels with me, a small book that fits into my purse. And when I'm on the metro train in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., instead of taking out my my phone when I can get service underground instead just taking out that Bible and making time at different points in the day to to read and definitely to pr to be in habits of prayer as well when I think about prayer in the midst of suffering um, that can be sometimes the most difficult time yes to really turn to prayer when you're angry and bitter and I think about some of the Psalms that David wrote, and you're wondering, I'm trying to imagine him writing this psalm. Like Psalm be, 130, uh, Out of the Depth? Yeah, to be read in front of, um, a, a midst of a bunch of people, that you're expecting them to have some kind of liturgical statement of, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me, O Lord, make haste to help me, let them be put to shame and confusion to seek my life, let them be turned back and brought to the side who desire my hurt. Let them be appalled because of their shame. We say, I mean, he's just gotten it out there. Thank God he gave us these psalms because this is exactly what many people feel. That yes. the psalms themselves yes. in, help you in your life from Judaism into Christianity. Yes. One thing that definitely was a prelude to my encountering Christ was reading Psalm 27 every day. I was at a job where I was being persecuted for being Jewish. My boss hated Jews. And it didn't help that I said to him I was an agnostic. He persecuted me just the same. And so I thought, well, gosh, there must be something good about being Jewish if he's persecuting me. So I asked my mom, who by then was identifying as a Messianic Jew, um, so a Jewish believer in, in Jesus, what to read. She said Psalm 27. I also just want to, to tell you, uh, just as an aside, since I mentioned that my mother was away from the church, that my big prayer since entering the church was that, was that my mother would return to the church and that my stepfather, who was at that time also, also a Jewish believer, um, that he would come in with her and uh, the, just this year, praise God, after 20 years of marriage, mm. my stepfather entered into full communion with the church. I'm now his, his godmother. Um, so, so my stepfather jokes that he's his own grandpa, which is true, actually. Well, he, he is. And, the, and the, the pastor, Father Joe, at St. Antoninus in Newark, uh, I think he was the one who joked that I was, was now uh, my mother's godmother-in-law. So I now have have the Catholic family I've always wanted. Of course, now that means I have to change my main intention. Now I'm praying for all my other relatives, all the Jewish people to know this joy in Christ. It's not wanting them to stop being Jewish. It's wanting them to understand the fulfillment of the covenant that God made with the Jewish people in the new covenant, in, in, the, in the Jewish Messiah, our Lord. Thank you, Dawn. Well, maybe one more thought. You, you're teaching online at a seminary now, and you've taught at a couple seminaries. You studied at seminaries. Maybe, maybe for our prayers, what's your experience with those who are studying at seminaries concerning what's going on in the church now? Any special prayers we should offer for those men on the journey? We should definitely pray for, pray for them, and we should pray that our Lord uses these events to help them to enter more deeply into the identity that they will have as a shepherd. You know, on the one hand, the sacrament of holy orders imprints upon them the character of Christ the priest. So there, there is a change in being, an ontological change, as we say. But uh, there is also a psychological, a spiritual change that the years of seminary formation 
are intended to to enable. So to pray that the, the seminarians use this to enter more deeply into the heart of, of Christ, the Good Shepherd. Dawn, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Lord bless you and your and your continued teaching and your writing and all the ways that God is using you in the apostolate for uh, His service. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. God bless you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Dawn's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you.